Good evening. I'm Paul Carice. I'm the director of the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership here at Arizona State University. And I'm very glad you could join us for this third event in the school's civic discourse project during this academic year. We're here for a discussion of ideological conformity in the national media. This year in the Civic Discourse Project, our theme is ideological conformity on campus and in American society. We also encourage you to explore the complete video archive of the school's speaker events and webinars since 2017, available on the Skettle YouTube channel and on our own website. That includes all the lecture and dialogue events in the Civic Discourse Project. On our website is S-C-E-T-L dot ASU dot edu. Bacha Ungar Sargon is the deputy opinion editor of Newsweek. Before that, she was the opinion editor of The Forward, the largest Jewish media outlet in America. She's written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, Newsweek, and the New York Review of Books Daily, among other publications. She's appeared regularly on national broadcast media as well, including MSNBC, NBC, and NPR. She, pull, she holds a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, in modern literature. Her 2021 book sets the stage for tonight's conversation, Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy. And her remarks tonight are entitled, Does the Media Promote the Idea that There Are Unchallengeable Orthodoxies and Is This Problematic for Democracy? Next up will be Megan McArdle, whom we're glad to welcome back to Skettle. She spoke here in 2019. Megan is a columnist at the Washington Post, where she covers the intersection of business, economics, and public policy. An early pioneer of internet journalism, her work has appeared in a range of outlets, including The Economist, The Atlantic, Newsweek, Time, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, The Guardian, and Reason Magazine. If you know all those titles, that's quite a range. <laughs> Ms. McArdle has served as the Egan Visiting Professor at Duke University's Journalism School, as a Fellow of the Chicago Institute of Politics, and a Bernard Schwartz Fellow at the New America Foundation. Her book, The Upside of Down, Why Failing Well is the Key to Success, was published in 2014. And her remarks tonight are entitled, Information Wants to be Free. Last but not least, we will hear from Dr. Jason Nichols, a senior lecturer in the African American Studies Department at the University of Maryland College Park. He was the longtime editor in chief of Words, Beats, and Life, the global journal of hip hop culture, the first peer reviewed journal of hip hop studies. In 2016, he co edited a book with Ohio State University Press entitled La Verdad, an International Dialogue on Hip Hop Latinidades if I got that right. Among several awards, the Office of Multi Multicultural Student Education at University of Maryland College Park gave Dr. Nichols the Academic Excellence Award for Outstanding Faculty. The Student Success Leadership Council at College Park awarded him the M. Lucia James Impact Award. And in 2015, Jason was given the Faculty Advisor of the Year Award by the, the College Park Chapter of the NAACP. So now for a discussion of the question, ideological conformity, are woke newsrooms a danger for American democracy? Please join me in welcoming Bacha Ungar Sargon, Megan McArdle, and Jason Nichols. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's such a deep honor to be here. Um, the work of civil discourse and debate is not just central to the fabric of our society, it is the fabric of our society. It is the lifeblood of democracy. Nothing could be more important than what you're doing here, and thank you to the audience for coming out in person. It's always such a treat to see your faces. Um, so the program says I'm going to speak for the next 10 minutes on the question of does the media promote the idea that there are unchallengeable orthodoxies, and is this problematic for democracy? As the author of a book called Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy, you can probably guess that I think the answer is yes, the media does promote the idea that there are unchallengeable orthodoxies, and yes, this is problematic for democracy. 
Now, as I say this, I am mindful of the fact that one of my co-panelists is a writer with dissenting views at one of the most prominent papers in the country. And the other one of my co-panelists is a writer for me at Newsweek who I disagree with so thoroughly that I absolutely have to know what he thinks on most topics just to make sure that I and my readers are engaging with the smartest version of the other side when we form our opinions. Um, in other words, um, in this room, on this stage shortly, are two examples of heterodoxy in the mainstream media. So I am aware that the task I have set myself is not an easy one. I think that woke no newsrooms are a threat to democracy because they have limited the viewpoints that are allowed in the mainstream media to the views of a tiny sector of the American public, and that tiny sector is an economic and cultural elite whose views are very distant from those of the average American on most issues from gender to race to immigration to the economy to COVID. When I say woke newsrooms, I'm not using the word woke to refer to what it used to mean when it was coined by black activists in the 70s who used the phrase stay woke as shorthand for stay away of the ways and aware of the ways in which the state continues to deny black Americans equal protections before the law. I obviously think it's incredibly important that we talk about those things. And indeed, I have been very gratified to see that now the conservative media is increasingly addressing issues of racial justice. I am using the word woke in the way sociologists do to refer to something that happened in 2015, which is when white liberals started showing up in polls as more extreme in their views on race than black and Hispanic Americans. Um, it, it, this phenomenon, so, so, social scientists have dubbed the great awakening. Um, they found that in polling in 2015 started to show that white liberals had adopted a super academic or woke lens for thinking about race. They started to express the belief that power, privilege, and agency are the exclusive provenance of white people and those adjacent to them, like Jews and Asians, while people of color are routinely denied these things. A Yale study from 2018 summarized the effects of the Great Awakening nicely. The study found a difference between how white liberals and white conservatives talk to black and Hispanic Americans. This was the difference. White liberals, this 2018 Yale study found, dumb down their vocabulary when talking to people of color, and white conservatives don't. Here's a quote from that study. Most whites, particularly socio-political liberals, now endorse racial equality. Archival and experimental research reveals a subtle but reliable ironic consequence. White liberals self-present less competence to minorities than to other whites. That is, they patronize minorities stereotyped as lower status and less competent. Just think about that for a minute. When white liberals encounter a black or Hispanic American, they immediately stereotype them as lower status and start to use lower level vocabulary. And white conservatives don't do this. That is wokeness in a nutshell. That is the phenomena that sociologists are talking about. Believing that the color of somebody's skin immediately marks them as lower status than you and in need of your beneficence and then acting to compensate accordingly. As I'm sure you can tell from my tone, I think this is disgusting um, and deeply racist. And needless to say, as the polling shows, but also as all of your encounters will show you, um, people of color don't see themselves this way. But whether they know it or not, this is how white progressives have started to think and started to behave, especially those at the top of the socioeconomic spectrum. So a recent Pew Research Center study made this clear when it found that just 6% of Americans are progressives. Progressives are the whitest and the most highly educated of the groups that make up the Democratic coalition. And it's these progressives, these 6%, who have these woke views on race. For example, the view that, quote, most, U most American um, institutions need to be completely rebuilt because they are fundamentally biased against some racial and ethnic groups. And meanwhile, just 6% of black Americans are in that group of progressives. 
So how did wokeness and economic privilege come to be two sides of the same coin? Well, you can read my book for a history on that, but for now, suffice it to say that the media played a big role in the Great Awakening. Data shows that starting in 2011, not incidentally the year the New York Times erected its online paywall and went all in on digital media, words like white privilege and marginalized and then people of color in the same sentence as the word marginalized, uh, started to appear with just exponential frequency as media outlets tried to capitalize on the tools of digital media, and I can talk much more in depth about how that works later if that's of interest. Um, but the Great Awakening was actually only the culmination of a long-term process that had already been underway for decades, a status revolution among liberals, including liberal journalists. Journalism used to be a low-status, working-class trade. Today, it's a profession made up of elites, mostly that 6% of white progressives. It may look like we have a partisan divide ruling our media. What we actually have is a massive class divide, a situation where the liberal media outlets, which represent the majority by far, are made up of and cater to a teeny tiny minority of people who have extremely embarrassing views on race and gender. And both the journalists at these outlets and the audiences they are catering to, other rich white progressives, have a habit of public shaming and firing campaigns against people who dissent from their views, hence enforcing orthodoxies. So um, this part is new. American journalism throughout the po post-war era was built on catering to the broadest spectrum of American society, and as a result, journalists who have always been more liberal than Americans more broadly were forced to do the hard work of persuasion. Because the business model of the news used to rely on having the largest, most bipartisan audience possible, Liberals couldn't indulge in navel-gazing or demonizing those who didn't agree with them, even those with truly disgusting views, as you know, many Americans had for much of our history. They had to address the concerns and discomforts of those who disagreed with them, which they did, and the result was an agonizingly slow but ultimately successful effort to make America more tolerant. Today, we are seeing the process that was so successful throughout the 20th century reverse itself. And once again, the media is playing a crucial role. Unlike print newspapers and magazines that made their money through circulation, digital media is powered by engagement and subscriptions, two methods of making money that rely on abandoning the great American middle to cater instead to the most extreme parts of your audience. And again, my, my book is full of details about exactly how that works. As a result, those same liberal media outlets that caressed America into a more tolerant society are now committed to another business model which involves enraging affluent progressives and turning them against their fellow Americans if they don't share their views, which have gotten more and more extreme. The medium of the medium turned out to be the message. Back when they were catering to the vast American middle, America's liberal media managed to change a once racist nation into one that overwhelmingly favors Dr. King's vision, that the only society worth living in is a colorblind one. Today, America's leftist media, chasing the clicks of an overeducated progressive elite, demonizes anyone who shares Dr. King's vision as racist for daring to erase the rarefied privilege of the marginalized. America's liberal media once turned the nation in favor of gay marriage by targeting middle and working class readers and viewers and convincing them that they too might know someone excluded from the joys of marriage due to their sexual orientation. Now legacy outlets demonize and deplatform gay activists who are opposed to gender affirming care in children. Naturally, the right has its version of this. People who disagree with the right's stance on abortion or transgender issues are smeared as baby killers or groomers. Chasing digital traffic, the media outlets of both sides have abandoned the vast middle to make money and consolidate power for elites. And economic, and economic policy has followed apace. NAFTA, globalization, the decimation of the American working class. That is a disaster for any democratic society as it has been for ours. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, so the, the title of my talk is a little abrupt. I should have uh, given the second half of it, which is information wants to be free, but journalists want to get paid. So I agree with a, a lot of, uh, of, of what Bacha says. Um, what I want to try to do is explain it uh, rather than defend it or inveigh against it. So uh, somewhat to my dismay, I have reached an age where I find myself telling the young people how it used to be. Um, <laughs> During a recent trip to Cornell, I had lunch with students and found myself explaining such uh, ancient history as pay telephones, um, movie listings, carbon copies, and how to find a job using only a newspaper and your own two hands. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about this world, and one of the things I've been thinking about is that many of the things that disturb us about the media, but more broadly about our politics, are the death throes of that old media model. Um, this is certainly not news to Bacha, it's probably not news to a lot of you, but let me talk a little bit about what that world looked like. So if you are old enough to remember when news came in convenient 24-hour bundles and you didn't have to think about it until the next day, um, and when the newspaper was as much a guide to everyday living as it was to what's happening in Kazakhstan, um, take a minute and think back to the media market of our youth. What was it like? What were its defining characteristics? Um, and the rest of you young people can just like gape in awe as I explain that really, no, you, there was no way to find out what was playing at the movie theater unless you bought a newspaper. Um, obviously, I can't cover everything in 10 minutes, but I want to talk about a few of what I think are the really defining and important characteristics of that market and how that is showing up in today's battles. Um, so, I mean, you know, first thing, like, are newsrooms woke? Yes. Right? We, we, we've known this for a while. We've known that the media leans overwhelmingly to the left. 95 plus percent of my colleagues vote either you know, vote Democratic, support Democrats, or support someone to the left of the Democrat. I don't say just my colleagues at the Washington Post. I mean generally in the mainstream media. Um, that is a fairly new development. It used to be more like one third, two thirds. Uh, you know, one third conservative, two thirds liberal. But we are now so liberal that it's sort of questionable whether you should call us the mainstream media. Um, the first important thing about the old media world was that even though that was true then, even though it was more liberal than not, they had a lot of reasons to try to be balanced. Um, so why was that? So first of all, the most powerful bits of that media had monopolies or oligopolies. There were three networks. Most towns had one newspaper. If you lived in a big city, you had two. If you lived in New York, you had three. And so when you have a, a, a monopolist, as any economist will tell you, their incentive is to maximize the extent of their market, right? They're not trying to carve out a competitive niche. They're not competing with anyone. They make the most money by selling the most to, to the most people. Um, so the second thing is that these monopolies are supported by advertising, not by subscribers. Now, people subscribe to magazines. They subscribe to newspapers, et cetera. But those subscriptions didn't even cover the cost of putting the physical dead tree in your hands with the print on it. All of the reporting, everything else, that was paid for by the ads. Interestingly, not just the big department store ads, the movie ads, but the classified ads were about 50% of the revenue of a normal newspaper back then. So all of those things um, have changed, obviously, <laughs> radically since the internet. Third, media markets were defined by physical limits. A newspaper's market was how far a delivery truck could drive in a day. A magazine's market was how fast is this going to get, how fast can I print this, and how fast can I get this into people's hands through the US mail. A television or radio station's market was literally how far can light waves travel carrying my signal before it peters out. Taken in concert, these three facts produce a media that tried to appeal to as many people as possible in a distinct local market. They bundled comics and sports and news in a convenient package to get as many people as possible reading um, because that maximized their market. And they tried to avoid picking sides in controversial fights because people who feel slighted cancel their subscriptions. And because advertisers really, 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 I cannot emphasize this enough, really do not like being printed, having their ads run next to political news or opinions that make people angry, which is why so many political sites fail <laughs> on the web. Um, this was easier to do because they were local. They could tailor themselves to the community. The Wichita paper was a lot more conservative than the New York paper. The internet blew this up, not just because it 
competed with old companies for news. That's actually the smallest part of it, although people who are competing with the, main, the dreaded MSN think that it's the biggest part. The biggest, the biggest part is it created new and more efficient channels for advertising. Craigslist and Monster took all the classified ads. Facebook and Google took the rest. It also created massive economies of scale. So you're no longer bound by how far a truck or a light wave can travel. Um, what, that tell, what that means is that it's now much more efficient, efficient to produce these things in a centralized way and maximize the extent of your market across a country or a language. Um, so it forces us to think differently. It forces us to get bigger. Most local newspapers have died or will in the next decade. But it also forces us to change our, our funding model. We can't depend on advertising. So what do we turn to? We turn to subscriptions. Um, you know, the, as I say, the motto of the early internet was information wants to be free. Problem is, journalists still got to get paid. What we do is, believe it or not, very expensive. And the most expensive part is actually the part that makes people the least angry. It's the reporting. Opinions are cheap and fast. Finding out what some city councilor said to another last Monday, that takes a long time. So this is bad for democracy in one obvious way, right? Everything's turning into a national outlet. You will have noticed this yourself, right? If you, see, if you look in politics, everything's national. No one's campaigning, even people in governor's races and state senate races, they're all covering, they're, they're campaigning on big national, because that's what people see in the news. The local news is dying, and that is forcing everyone's attention to the areas, not just that are biggest, they're the areas where they dis have the most disagreements because there is more cultural spread across the United States than there was in a local community. It's also the areas where it's hardest to personally affect anything because there are 330 million other people who have an opinion about this too. So it is a recipe for division. It's bad for democracy because there's no effective check on local government anymore because no one's doing those stories. And I would really like to think that like volunteer efforts can take up the slack, but I'm afraid I don't believe that that's true. Um, sub other things, subscribers want news that flatters them. Right, to get someone motivated to subscribe is a lot harder when I have to sell it solely on the strength of the news rather than the comics or the sports page or the movie ads or the classified ads, right? That, that bundle got a lot of people in. Now I have to get someone motivated to subscribe to me. How do I do that? Usually I make them terrified and angry. <laughs> um, people like to feel that they're joining a club and these particular clubs are, are clubs that enjoy getting angry at each other. <laughs> Um, but the clubs, the, there's another thing, because we're nationalizing, we've essentially concentrated the news in two cities, New York and Washington. Look, I was born in one of them, I live in the other one. They're great cities, they're great places, they're full of lovely people, although I know many people who live outside them don't believe this. The problem is, they're full of lovely people who are really not very much like any people who live anywhere else. <laughs> we talk about things differently. We are urban, we are educated, we are extremely educated. We're not just educated, we are now, because Basically, these, these big nationalizing, there's a lot fewer jobs. Journalism is just hemorrhaging jobs. And so it's turned into a tournament model. And who's winning the tournament? The same people who are winning every other economic tournament in our society, people who went to a small handful of very highly selective schools, almost all. That's where journalism comes from now. They don't even know people who aren't like that. And that is biasing our journalism in all sorts of bad ways. Obviously, one of them is political. We are prone to groupthink like everyone else. We have institutions where we try to fight against that. We have all sorts of, if your mother says her, you, she loves you, check it out. Um, I think she does. I asked. <laughs> I asked around, like they said they, they think, but you know, I'm not sure. Um, that said, when things disconfirm what we would like to believe, what is important to us, and I mean, here's a, a thing about politics in the 21st century is that they bundle in weird ways. If I know your views on abortion, I can predict your views on global warming. Why? Because it's part of your identity. Finding out facts that disconfirm your identity and then speaking facts that disconfirm your identity that make your friends angry, this is a terrifying prospect. We are no more immune to that than anyone else. And here's the other thing, I'll, I'll close by this, is that this all played into cultural forces. You know, I've talked about all the structural forces. There was also a cultural moment on campus, a, a critical theory movement arose that was pretty skeptical about free speech. I understand why. Um, and like, I don't agree with it, but I understand it. 
But they created a permission structure for people who were looking to make the mainstream media into a tool for their political views. The people, the, the critics who said, don't do this, he said, she said, tell the truth. And we saw this Trump created the conditions under which we gave in. We were fighting an existential battle for good and evil. We missed stories. We missed Donald Trump, but we also missed Hispanic voters shifting because we, in a very rarefied group, assumed that all they cared about was immigration because that's how we thought of it. Despite the fact that our newsrooms are more diverse racially, gender, and other ways, which is great and far, took far too long, because we're such a narrow class, we are prone to an, an exquisite group think that this is more and more stories, and by the way, offends half of the country. And they create their own media, but the, that media isn't doing the job we're not. Instead, they, are, they, they only report out the stories that, where we make mistakes or where we are in the biggest battle with them. They are like the, the satellite, the moon to our Earth, rather than becoming a, a vital new ecosystem. These are poisonous dynamics, and I wish that I knew that describing the problem told me how to solve it. I don't. I don't know how we get back from this. I only know that if we don't find some middle ground, we are going to rip this country apart. So firstly, I, I want to thank uh, ASU for coming here and I, or for inviting me. And uh, I'll be dropping off my CV, just in case anyone wants to take a look at it, because I love this campus. It's a beautiful place. I also want to thank uh, Carol and uh, Marlene and everyone who helped me through this process to make it here. Uh, I also just, you know, because I'm an academic, I want to start out with a quiz, and that is, who said this? White Americans must recognize that justice for black people cannot be achieved without radical changes in the structure of our society. No idea? That would be Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Believed that we need radical changes to the structure of our society. Now, firstly, uh, I'm going to kind of piggyback off of what Batia said, but just a little bit differently. And that is, I think it's important to reiterate that the term woke started in the black community as a way to express that one was aware of injustices both overt and covert. The term was co-opted, or rather hijacked, or better yet still, colonized in bad faith by right-wing ideologues in the media to encompass anything that is absurd or unfair in the name of social justice. To use the term this way is to ignore its origins and to tacitly participate in anti-blackness. We've seen this with other terms like critical race theory or intersectionality or even Karen. However, while I disagree with how some use those terms, I'll defend their right to do it. Freedom is paramount in a functioning society, more so than order, because people who feel free will often behave in an orderly manner. People who feel free respect and trust their institutions. People who feel constrained, oppressed, misled, and silenced will rebel against the power they feel is doing so. One of the ways of keeping order was to control the access to information, especially for the most marginalized and oppressed. Many of you are familiar with the antebellum period and the policies regarding enslaved and many free Africans. They could not marry, own businesses or land, or travel without a pass. But the part that maintained the system the most prevented Africans from learning to read and write. That controlled the flow of information. Black people were not able to communicate about their condition, strategize across long distances, read anti-slavery newspapers, or read their Bibles to counter perverted messages they were fed to support the institution of slavery. The most radical opponents of slavery that history records, the ones who rose up and led insurrections against the institution, were black literate men like Nat Turner, 
Gabriel Prosser, and Denmark Vesey. Conversely, in subsequent decades, alternative media was incredibly important in the fight for human and civil rights, beginning perhaps with William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator or Frederick Douglass's North Star newspapers in 1831 and 1847, respectively, black advocacy and nationalist organizations like the NAACP, the Urban League, the UNIA, and later the Nation of Islam and Black Panther Party all had their own newspapers to challenge the dominant narrative about black people published or pushed in popular culture and media. It was black people armed with stones against tanks of disinformation, disguised as mainstream media and news. From minstrel shows to the film The Birth of a Nation, which was largely responsible for the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan into a five million strong army of terror, white supremacy has always dominated the American media, including the newsroom. For some reason, I feel like that CV isn't going to get read now. <laughs> Arguably, no one has had more of an impact on academic and historical memory in the 20th century than the United Daughters of the Confederacy who erected monuments to the traitorous Confederates. In fact, Arizona had a Confederate monument outside of its state house that stood alongside Dr. King that the right, you know, respects so much, and the Navajo Code Talkers. The state had at least five Confederate monuments in total. And if I'm not mistaken, your state had one battle throughout the entire Civil War. But you have five monuments. Explain that. However, civil rights and the advent of television brought about a new openness, especially in news. Racial violence didn't simply lurk in the shadows and was no longer simply a subject subject to historical memory and carefully crafted narratives like the myth of the black male rapist. People saw the brutality in real time being reported by journalists trained in objectivity. Civil rights student activism spilled over into academia and created black studies, which then led to the creation of women's studies, Chicano studies, Native American and US Latino studies, and cultural and ethnic studies as a movement. But objectivity couldn't stand for long. Nixon administration senior official John Ehrlichman, when speaking of the war on drugs, said the following, quote, you know, you want to know what this was about? The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You know what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to either be against the war or black. But by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meanings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did, end quote. A decade later, Rush Limbaugh created a genre of news opinion that catered to those angered by civil rights policy like affirmative action, busing, and feminism. That later grew into Roger Ailes and Rupert Murdoch's creation, Fox News, which added a visual component to Limbaugh's innovation. NBC, of course, created a counterpoint. With, their, with the advent of the internet, publications and blogs each came along with a political splant, slant, vying to capture the imagination of a niche audience. Until the period following one of the darkest days in American history, 9-11, the country was largely behind the government. And while there was always there's always been a healthy distrust of government and state power. The news media, who most people trusted because they had historically kept government in line, also backed the government narrative. 
We remembered Watergate when investigative reporters chased the story and followed where it led. No one was too big and powerful to be exposed. So we were told Saddam Hussein somehow was involved and he had WMDs. I remember coming close to blows with, a clo with one of my closest friends who was relatively newly enlisted in the Air Force as we watched the invasion on television. He yelled and pointed at the screen as the Iraqis pulled down a statue of Saddam and he argued that we were liberators. As the years passed, the nation, both left and right, Democrat, Republican, and independent, found that the invasion was predicated on a lie. It didn't bring us together, but it made us equally mistrust and perhaps even despise the news media. They were supposed to inform us and tell us the truth. They lied, or at least they were derelict in their investigative and truth-seeking duties. We watched as our family members and friends returned from war, injured either physically or psychologically. The most ardent supporters of the war, the conservative right, felt especially insulted. At the same time, the internet gave us more options for news opinion. We had Alex Jones and QAnon conspiracy theorists, each with their own platform. Twitter and Facebook gave others enormous platforms and followings as long as they countered the popular narrative. They began to think the mainstream newsroom was the enemy of the people. The worst part about that is that instead of reforming the newsroom, people have moved to trusting alternatives who sometimes are disreputable simply because they're spouting thoughts that are outside of the mainstream. Now, people like Christopher Rufo will tell their vast audience that critical race theory is coming to hard, harm their children. I don't know if Christopher Rufo understands what critical race theory actually is, but I do know he doesn't care. Rufo said, quote, the other frames are wrong too. Cancel culture is a vacuous term and doesn't translate into a political program. Woke is a good epithet, but it's too broad and too terminal and too easily brushed aside. Critical race theory is the perfect villain. Instead of expanding intellectual conversations, they've moved to ban books, including ones on Rosa Parks and Malala Yousafzai. Banning the study of critical race theory, which is a very broad intellectual dialogue on inequality and white supremacy, along with attempts to ban other controversial material and concepts like socialism, communism, totalitarianism, and many other political and social philosophies is wrong, not only morally, but strategically. Learning about things you disagree with will only firm your position. The problem is not the woke newsroom. It's that the newsroom lacks credibility. It's the lying newsroom. It's the newsroom that wants to be first more than it wants to be correct. At times, it's the ideologically singular newsroom. It's the blending of entertainment with news in pursuit of profit. We live in an age of disinformation spread by profiteers and those seeking fame and social media clout. The difficult part is that we should not censor them. We must challenge them and defeat them with facts. Academia has a unique responsibility to enter con contextualized facts into the discussion. We have a responsibility to make sure disinformation does not become mainstream by challenging their narrative. We spoke about birth of a nation and the myth of the black male rapist. It was the research and investigative reporting of a woman, a brave woman, one of my heroes, Ida B. Wells Barnett. And if you're a journalist, you should know that name one of the most important journalists in American history that directly challenged the notion that the lynching of black men in the South even involved the accusation of sexual assault. The problem with our newsrooms is that we have too many Alex Joneses and not enough Ida B. Wells. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much to the three of you, to each of you for your presentations. I want to begin by saying thank you for sharing a stage, uh, physically but in the larger forum here, to have a range of divergent views disagreeing with each other uh, to share a stage. So I think I have time for two main questions to, to pose um, to all three of you. I'm going to start with what I will call the, the the Ungar Sargon thesis here, but I'm going to emphasize, as I think she means it in the book, that this applies to the national news media today on the left and the right and every, everything in between. The thesis being that for the news media broadly defined, it, it is a necessity, it's a fundamental tenet of the profession in that media, that there must be a heterodoxy of views uh, addressed uh, and covered, so to speak, because, on her thesis, journalism, broadly defined, has a civic duty in a liberal constitutional democracy. It's not, in other words, an autonomous profession. It, it's a civic profession. Journalism, therefore, must aspire to a kind of aspirational objectivity or accounting for a heterodoxy and pluralism of views. And this applies as much to MSNBC and, say, CNN, as it's developed in the past decade or so, as it does to Fox News or, or to talk radio. Uh, aspirational adjectivity, heterodoxy, pluralism of views, rather than an institution adopting a narrower ideological uh, view. And that would be obviously news reporting and analysis, but maybe even in the tone of opinion writing, so as to not be dismissive, demeaning, uh, condemning, condemning opposing views, but somewhat more respectful and civil in the disagreement. So that complicated restatement of the thesis. Um, I actually don't think that, so. Okay. <laughs> so you get, uh, uh, Bache, get, you get to speak first. Well, um, uh, what the golden eras of American journalism, uh, the journalism wasn't nonpartisan. It was extremely partisan. Um, it was just partisan on behalf of the masses. So, you know, the example I like to give is like in the early 20th century in New York City, you could be a communist and there were 10 communist papers that you would never dream of opening because they were not the right kind of communism. You had your 11th communist <laughs> newspaper, you know? It, it, those papers were deeply partisan, but they were partisan on behalf of the masses, on behalf of the working class and the poor, not on behalf of the elites. And they were brutal. And they were, of course, the most brutal to the people closest to them, because that's always the way. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that I think that journalism has a moral imperative to contain both sides. I would say a society that um, erases and, and, and uh, renders um, unconscionable the views of 90% of its citizens is in deep trouble and its democracy is in trouble. But my problem with today's media is not that it's partisan. It's that it's partisan on behalf of the elites on both sides of the political spectrum. Um, you know, I, I have a, I, there's a thing that young journalists like to say, it's, it's an old saying that the job of journalism is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And I really have a problem with this. <laughs> um, because I think like, look, say that there is a really comfortable dude who, has be, who is being grievously slandered by a poor person. Should I repeat the grievous, grievous slander because the poor person will be happy? And, and no, obviously, I think our job is to say the thing that is true. Now, I don't think that that means that we have to aim for some sort of every, every, you know, every organization has a certain number of X, but I do think that across the profession, what we should aim for is a shared set of norms about saying the thing that is true with the understanding that we're gonna see things differently. You know, where you, where you stand does depend on where you sit. Um, it is hard, you cannot know some, like what it is truly like to be anyone else. Um, you can try your best and everyone should, but diversity of, of viewpoints, of backgrounds, of race, of gender, of everything, we need all of it. Um, I think the problem is that what we no longer have um, is first of all an honesty about, about the fact that we have biases, right? Like we, we in the mainstream media know that we're all liberal. We know that none of us voted for Donald Trump. 
Um, I mean, I'm an opinion, so I wrote, you know, like I wrote that I wasn't going to vote for Donald <laughs> Trump, but we all know it. But like, then we go, and we are very, we are very quick to see the ways in which conservative media. Oh my God, can you see they just left out that fact, and they are like, it's just groupthink all the way down, and they are ideologically biased. And then we act as if like we're not like that. We're special. We're not normal human beings who who don't, who maybe downplay things that we we don't want to see. And I think it 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 obviously happens that we miss stories, that we don't tell stories that make us uncomfortable, that will make our friends uncomfortable, that will make it, like, I, I was, I think, the first major columnist to write about trans women in sports. And I didn't actually have a strong opinion about it. And nonetheless, I'm writing about it, and everyone I'm talking to is like, thank you for doing this, you are so brave. And I was like, these are like the words you do not want to hear, right? Brave, no, bad word, bad word, do not say brave. But I mean, here's the thing, right, if you had read newspaper, mainstream newspapers, and if you had watched broadcasts, I think that w the sense you would have gotten about that issue was, okay, yeah, there's some of the jealous teammates. This is Leah Thomas, the pen swimmer, who's a trans woman. Uh, yeah, there's some jealous teammates who are against it and a bunch of reactionaries. But like most good people, you know, they understand that this is really important. Well, you know, honestly, like what I encountered was the exact opposite of that. I struggled to find someone who is not an activist or like a personal friend of Leah Thomas who supported her swimming, and people who weren't connected to it in any way. Ex ultra liberal friends of my mother who asked what I was working on <laughs> over dinner and like unloaded on a 20 minute, this is outrageous, I can't believe it, right? So we were doing our readers a disservice. We were telling them that the world didn't, was in a way that it was not because we were afraid to offend our friends. And this has real consequences. I think it had real consequences in elections where we were, we were afraid to find out that maybe Donald Trump could win. It, is, it has consequences when you are telling people, when you are creating this world that isn't real, in which everyone can live in their happy bubble and believe that, that the things that they want to believe are true are all true, and then reality comes and punches them in the face and you are responsible for that. You're responsible for hurting your own side. And so one of the things that I try to convince con uh, conservatives of, and then I will shut up, um, is that like conservatives are convinced that, that uh, re Democrats get a huge boost from having the mainstream media in their pocket. And in fact, I think that was true 15 years ago. The, there was like a, I don't know, one to two point advantage to Democrats just for the fact that like the media liked them. And so would go easier on stories that made Democrats look bad. The problem is now, we're actually so far over the line that it's hurting Democrats. Because it is, Democrats are not, they're playing to their friends on Twitter and they're playing to the mainstream media and like we don't represent the voters. We, are, we represent now a very narrow slice of the electorate and you cannot win an election with that slice of the electorate. And so I think in fact, in lots of ways, it's now hurting Democrats to be this bubbled. And it's hurting Republic, it's, I mean, you know, you only need to look at the candidates Pennsylvania, right, Oz, and it, the can't, it's also hurting Republicans to be so bubbled and to genuinely believe that they can nominate subpar uh, candidates who think that the election was stolen when most of the voters think that's insane. So I, I think it is really damaging and that what we need to come back to is some, we don't need to all agree on values or even all, what all of the facts are or what they mean. We need a shared process for validating what a fact is and for thinking about how to do good reporting, and right now we don't have that. Jason. Man, there's, there's a lot I wanna say. Um, <laughs> firstly, um, I think one of the things, you know, with, with your original question, uh, you mentioned MSNBC and Fox, and you know, I, I'm a contributor, you know, just full disclosure, I'm a contributor at a, at a cable news network, a smaller one, um, and it's a right-wing one called Newsmax. And I'll tell you, um, I think we should have a disclaimer that says this is news opinion entertainment. You know what I mean? Um, because there, there's serious journalism, you know, like I was talking about to you earlier, you know, not trying to show her all my cards, but, <laughs> you know, we, we were speaking earlier and I was like, you know, we're not finding out about narco states that are developing in West Africa and seeing in investigative reporters going up there. They're having guys like me sit on a panel and opine about the news. 
You know what I mean? Because uh, it's cheap, right? It's, it's the cheapest cheap, thing to exactly. produce. It's, it's a lot more difficult. No offense. I mean, like, you, you are no. very high value and, and should be paid a lot of money for this, but. Yeah. I should be paid more. I, I would be, you know. but, um, but yes, you know, that I think it's, it's you know, I, I don't consider, people ask me and say, well, you're a journalist. And I'm like, I'm not a journalist. You know, I'm an opinion pundit, you know what I mean? And an academic. Um, and, you know, I, I somewhat separate those two. But I think it's important for us to remember, you know, we have to define what the news media is today. You know, I, I'm not sure that, you know, there's, there's so much, it, and I agree with Batia that it was, it's always been partisan. There's always been partisan interest in the media. But at the same time, like when I think of Woodward and Bernstein, I think about them following where the facts led. You know, not necessarily saying, okay, this is what I want to present to the public. And I think the, the thing about what you were saying is that, I think a lot of times the media views itself as driving public opinion, you know, rather than presenting facts to the public. So if they are drivers of public opinion, then they can leave that little fact out of there and, you know, have it skewed one way or the other, or they can have kind of inflammatory language. Um, and I think also, you know, media, I think if we, if we, broadened it out even into social media, I think some of it is supposed to get you riled up and angry. That's why Leah Thomas was a story. Like, honestly, if you can name anybody in here that's not a swimmer, name anybody who won the, uh, the women's NCAA swimming championship other than Leah Thomas in the, in the last 20 years. Well, I mean, I, I reported the story. Yeah, you so reported the story. You're, <laughs> you're not allowed. But if you can, if nobody, nobody knew that. Nobody knew about those races. You know, my, my daughter swims. And to be honest, you know, this is just my opinion. I don't care. If she's, I'll, she swims against a trans girl. Girl, sorry. <laughs> Woman. Leah Thomas is in her 20s. Right, right, right. Well, beyond well, the girl. My, my daughter's 11. So, okay. you know what? I'm going to go up and give that kid a high five, just like I give all the other kids a high five. Like, it's, it's not going to offend me that my kid got smoked in a race. But, you know, at the same time, she gets smoked anyway, to be honest with you. <laughs> She's getting better, though. Uh, but, you know, so this, this was not something that was going to put food on our tables. You know what I mean? This was not, like, I think... Winning the, the NCAA championship. And so a lot of people were like, you know, looking to me, the few people that do look to me, were like looking for me to put out a strong opinion, a strong left-wing opinion. And I was like, I really don't have a big opinion about it. And I think we're allowed to not have opinions about everything as well. That is um, very healthy, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> and, like, and, and should be followed by more people just not yeah, having opinions about things. Yeah, it's okay to not have an opinion sometimes, you know? Um, particularly if it's something... You know, when, when I started to get into the rabbit hole and look about, look at like, you know, the facts about bone density and, you know, wingspan. And, and then I was reading, you know, Michael Phelps and his foot flexion is like 15% larger than the, you know, the average human. And, and so he's got a biological advantage. And I was just like, all right, I'm done with this. <laughs> like, this is not feeding my family. This is not feeding anyone else's family. Uh, this is for the NCAA to decide. You know, and I don't have to have an opinion on it. Um, I think the mainstream media, again, uh, it, it's gotten so in a place where it's about, you know, particularly with, with the advent of the internet, it's about selling papers. I mean, a lot of those papers, like you said, local media is going out of business. They've got to do whatever they can. And part of it is to get people angry and get them angered at their neighbors, you know, even if just because they have a different political view. And I think that's dangerous for, for our society. Okay, let me, let me shift to uh, Jason's profession in part, and Megan, you've held visiting positions in higher education, so the, the role of higher education in academia. Uh, Bacha um, speaks from a principle of justice and equality, mass democratic equality. So I think this question applies even to your uh, position. Uh, wh where, would, where would American citizens uh, 
uh, and, and the journalists as a subset of them learn this principle of justice and of equality. So here's my, my question. Is there a civic duty in higher education in America in the 21st century, colleges and universities, to emphasize a principle of heterodoxy and pluralism and civil disagreement, uh, particularly about political, social, economic, broadly civic views, uh, and that uh, Bach's thesis seems to suggest that the extraordinary transformation in recent decades of journalism as a profession, news media broadly defined, as, as uh, moving from a more mixed demographic, let's say, some, some higher education, college, university graduates, some not, now to overwhelmingly being university graduates. Uh, given that that's our current moment, is there a civic duty that all institutions of higher learning in America have for the sake of a healthy, pluralist, liberal constitutional democracy to rededicate themselves to a principle that you would think started with Socrates, but it seems to have been lost on many campuses, that uh, regarding these questions, and that it's a principle we've had Jonathan Rauch here in the past couple of years, a principle that applies to the natural sciences and other fields as well, a principle of making sure you have a certain skepticism and humility about your own point of view and making sure that on campus, in classrooms, in broader public programs, there's a principle of heterodoxy and pluralism, not, not let's to use the common term now, not canceling other points of view, but encouraging debate and disagreement in other points of view. Is, is there that kind of a, I'm hedging now, intellectual, but civic duty on American higher education campuses in relation to this crisis that all three of you, I think, are saying exists in, in the news media? Yes. Okay, so uh, that's yes. it. We can go to, uh, that's it, you heard it here. For, no. I'm going to say no, so I okay, want to hear what go. you guys yeah, have to I say. Have to say about that. <laughs> okay, good. All right, well, I'll start. So um, my answer is yes and no. Uh, one of the ways that I start my classes out is uh, at the beginning of the semester when I'm showing them the syllabus and everything, I start with this class has a bias. It reflects my biases and the biases of African American studies at the University of Maryland. And the truth is that all of your classes, save for a math class, will have a bias, including your science classes. What research do they consider legitimate? Where it comes from? The difference is I'm being open about the fact that this class has a bias in the, in the source material that I choose uh, and the lectures that I will give. I'm being open, I'm being honest with you, and I'm respecting you as an adult. Now, one thing that I promise, it is my pledge to you, I'm talking to you like you're my students, my pledge to you is that I will never use my biases against you in what you turn in and, and the, the work that you submit and your opinions and your worldview. I'm not here to teach you to think like me. I'm here to, to teach you critical thinking and how to formulate arguments. So my thing is, I, I try to make sure that, first of all, my classes would be very boring if we didn't have vigorous debate. I don't want to sit there and lecture the whole time. You know, Every now and again, I like to make a little scrabble move on my, on my phone. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, but no, but I like for students to engage one another and talk about these topics. And I, I'm somebody who says, I don't believe in safe spaces, I believe in safe people. How do you create a safe person? In my opinion, it's through dialogue and discussion, kind of like what we're having here. So as long as you're not trying to intimidate somebody, I want that kind of discussion. I want the issues to be uh, you know, vigorously discussed. In, in the classroom. You know, I always tell, give the example, and maybe it's an extreme one, but you heard me talk about the Confederacy. If someone comes in with a Confederate flag, it's not actually the real Confederate flag for us historians, but you know, someone comes in with a Confederate flag, you know, I'm not gonna tell them, don't come to class, because they're just gonna wear the, the shirt outside of class. I wanna engage them on why they're wearing it. 
I want them to hear their classmates' opinions about why it makes them uncomfortable. And then hopefully, that person will recognize that that shirt isn't appropriate to wear. So that's, you know, at least my, my thought about it is, I'm, not, I'm never, some of my favorite students who still email me to this day from 15 and 20 years ago, yes, I'm that old, um, some of my favorite students have been some of the most conservative ones. You know, and obviously I'm not a conservative person. And, I, and you know, also their parents know me because I, I, I used to be a regular on Tucker Carlson tonight. So a lot of their parents are like, my dad loves you. You're, you're his favorite liberal. You know, I hear that all the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, I, I believe in having, you know, discussion, the things that we're talking about you know, in terms of, of heterogeneity, but I'm not gonna change who I am. I'm not gonna sit there and give point counterpoint to everything. You are free as an adult, I don't teach high school, so you are free as an adult to find a counterpoint, you know, and, and you can use that source. And sometimes if the source is a little janky, I might be like, yo, this source is a little janky. But if you've got, you know, peer reviewed articles and things like that, that somehow, go against what it is that I assigned or my, you know, the, the perspective that I've provided, I'm 100% okay with that. And sometimes I reward it because that means you might have gone a step beyond to defend your position. Okay. That's what I want. Sorry, okay, I know great, I Great, great. So let's watch it. Well, Meg, what do you, are you, you're a yes. I'm a yes. Um, so there's uh, a common problem in of, of any information business, which is there's always a temptation to shade it just a little bit. Just leave out a few inconvenient facts, right? Um, this was the, the ratings agency problem during the financial crisis, right? It's like, well, if we just manipulate the process just a little bit, we get a much better result. And the problem is, as I say, I think reality eventually comes and punches you in the face. So I think the first problem is that like, that's kind of wrong, right? It's wrong to deceive people, even in a good cause. I'm not saying that, look, if, I, if I'm hiding Jews in my basement and the Nazis come knocking, I'm gonna be like, nope, no Jews here, but, in general, you should not deceive people. Um, the second problem is, I say, is as I say, like the, the the reality problem is it makes you stupid. There's this thing on the internet that drives me batty. It's it's people who are like, I cannot even imagine, like imagine being a person who thought this. And what people think they're signaling is like, I am so virtuous that I cannot even put myself in the place of this moron slash cretin this villain, I, I can't even picture it, right? I'm just unable, because I am so morally pure that I can't picture doing bad people things like that. And what you're actually saying is I'm a moron. I lack imagination. I am unable to picture how any other human being who is not me thinks. And it's a terrible way to think, and it makes you stupid, and it makes you unaware of how the world operates, and it makes it impossible to build a society, right? And I think that, you know, the third problem is that, and I think that a big problem for academia, having reconceived itself as a left-wing project, A, it is missing stuff, it's making mistakes. And you see this, there's a, there's a series of great papers in social psychology about all, which was the, for those of you who didn't follow the stories closely, was an evergreen source of wonderful stories about what terrible, terrible human beings, because conservatives are scientifically proven. So, for example, conservatives are super authoritarian. Well, yes, because they were using a scale that's literally like the right-wing authoritarian scale. It is designed to ask people if they believe in right-wing authorities. And it turns out that if you change the authorities, if instead of asking people like, should children obey their parents, et cetera, if, in, if you instead ask them like, should people defer to environmentalists and let them make the decisions about the environment, it turns out left-wing people are huge authoritarians and right-wing people are like bloody freedom fighters, um, right? It makes you stupid, it makes you less good at your job. And now look, there is an alternative view, which is like, we can't afford that. We can't afford that with so many pressing social justice. And you saw this play out with uh, James Sweet, the president of the, American Historical Association wrote an article recently for like their little magazine 
arguing against presentism in history. And he gave a bunch of examples. And the funny thing was, he was fairly dinged for being vague and not pointing to actual examples from historians. But it was so clear that he was reaching outside of history so as not to actually name and shame any of his colleagues. So he went after the 1619 Project from the New York Times, also a bunch of conservative stuff. He went after a Ghanaian tour guide, weirdly. at um, and the, the reaction was, the, the sort of, the most telling reaction was, he should know better. He's giving conservatives ammunition. They're gonna weaponize this. He shouldn't be saying those things. And the problem is, conservatives don't trust you. We have, our crisis in this country, our biggest political crisis is an epistemic crisis. The only thing that you have to bring to political debates as an academic is your institutional credibility. It's your expertise. And people aren't stupid. If you don't tell them all the truth, if you only pick the truths that flatter your side, if you tell them that, like, how dare you say this? Conservatives might like it. They understand the game. They understand that you're not doing history anymore. You're doing politics. And there's a reason people don't trust politicians. And so I think that like on so many levels, it makes academia ineffective at what it is supposed to do, which is communicating truth, finding truths, at communicating truths. And it also, by the way, means that you have created a class of conservatives who wants to destroy you. And given how much academia is now state funded, it's just politically stupid. So they're not even doing politics right. They're doing it in the dumbest possible way. And I wish they would stop. And I think this is true of journalism too. Gotcha. Um, so I think um, there's like a temptation to be like, well, academia, you got us into this mess, now you get us out of it. But um, to me, the big problem with America is that it's led by people with a college degree. It's led by elites, it's led by the economically privileged, it's led by rich people. So I feel a little bit embarrassed to you know, come here, sit on your stage <laughs> and say this, but I, I actually think academia has way too much power right now. and. Um, it, it, really, it really doesn't matter. I mean, it's shown that you know, both it has the ability to fill newsrooms with people with really embarrassing views, but also that it does not have the ability to guide the nation and that the, the, it really does make you rethink, I'm sorry again, I say this with humility in this room, but it really does make you rethink the value of this liberal arts education. And I think especially because you know, across the nation in working class communities, people are debating everything and it's not a big deal you know like there, you can't walk into a nursing home in florida into a break room and not find republicans and democrats happily debating all of the issues of the day you know you think if you think you, hispanic voters right right now are in, in the midst of a massive flux right they're sort of sp almost split down the middle now if you think that those people who are also overwhelmingly represented in the working class are not in their families currently debating all the interesting political issues. Of course they are. Um, you, you, barbershops in New York are full of interesting debates about issues that we think of, you know, oh, these communities only have one way of seeing things. But when you're not in the elite, like the sorting, the segregating, the uh, polarization is a totally elite phenomenon. As soon as you get out of the places where people make millions of dollars off of the polarization myth, Americans just aren't polarized. On the major issues of the day, the most important values that this nation was founded on and never lived up to, there is no longer a partisan divide. And on all the other issues, people are happily debating if they're not part, if they haven't gone to university. If they have gone to university, they cannot stand the fact that anybody disagrees with them. So pardon me that I don't think that the university is the answer. I mean, I think the answer is give the working class back a voice in the public sphere and you will solve the problem. Okay, with that, we need to, uh, uh, I, no, I'm not expressing any judgment, it's the tyranny of the clock. It's the tyranny of the clock. And uh, we, we do want to give some time for the audience to pose some uh, questions. So the microphone in the center aisle, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, we do ask that you pose a brief question, not, not make a long statement. Go ahead. Or yours. Um, yeah, I have a question. It regards to um, uh, like uh, you talk about bias, and then each side has their bias. Um, first of all, is it is it um, realistic to be able to try and find an unbiased uh, an unbiased uh, source or something? Like some people say, oh, look at one side, look at the other, but that's still not giving you an unbiased source because you're missing um, you're missing some of the bigger issues. Um, 
is it possible to find unbiased source? And sec second of all, coming off of that, um, is it maybe more valuable to admit your own bias and just debate it from that perspective? Okay. Anyone? Um, I don't think you can find an unbiased source because, like, there's no such thing, right? Every every human being, you actually need biases. You couldn't survive without them. You would you would not even be able to choose what to eat, right, uh, for breakfast in the morning. But so I don't think that exists. But I do think there are people who try to play it straighter than others within each intellectual community. There are people who are intellectually honest and will not say something that they or they will not imply something that they don't think is true or say something that they know isn't true. And then there are people in that community who will do those things for the greater cause, find the, the former. But I think the most interesting thing, there's a guy, a blogger who I love named Scott Alexander, and now he's a newsletter writer on a platform called Substack. And he does this thing called adversarial collaborations between his readers, where he gets two people who just disagree on an issue to write jointly an article about it, and so all that contains is what they can agree on. And here's the thing I would actually like to remind us as like the happy news. We agree on almost everything. <laughs> there is no, we're not having a lot of arguments like, hey, should pedophilia, should like child abuse be legal? No, we all agree. Should we murder our grandparents and push them out on ice floes? No, we all agree. I don't know, I think most people agree about that, <laughs> right? So like, we're, there's actually most people agree about most things and it's useful to take people who actually disagree about some stuff and remind us that actually there's a whole bunch of stuff that they disagree on, that they agree on even while disagree, disagreeing on interpretations. Well, can I just say something really quickly? Um, Christopher Lash, who's an amazing writer, wrote an amazing book called Revolt of the Elites that everybody should read had this great point. He said that you know, people act like, you know, they say that um, you know, people are ignorant and therefore people are not engaged in, 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 in uh, politics because a lot of Americans sort of have stopped voting and have disengaged. And he's like, the, it's the exact opposite. They're not engaged and therefore they're ignorant because the only thing that makes you seek out data is being part of a debate, right? Like when you're in a debate with somebody and they tell you, they're like, you're wrong because of this. Like, boy, oh boy, do you go running for the Google, right? To find out like evidence to prove them wrong. And I think that that's really Really what we're seeing. I mean, the media likes to call it like, oh, nobody trusts us. But actually, I think what we're seeing is a lot of skepticism among readers. And I think that's a really good thing. People are out there reading things in the New York Times and being like, I'm sure that's wrong, and then Googling and finding out facts. So I'm not sure that it's as bad as, as we think. Uh, my question is, do you think on purpose satire has a place anymore, or is that just gone? The, the deliberate. Satire. Yeah, a deliberate satire. I know Fox News and CNN, they do satire on themselves accidentally, <laughs> but on purpose, satire has kind of gone away from mainstream media okay. for the past so several years. You mean like The Daily Show? And yeah, like The Daily Show yeah. and, and The Colbert Report. Even they have kind of changed in the past, I don't or know, six years. The Babylon years. Bee. The Babylon Bee, for right. example. Onion, or the onion, yeah. Snopes doesn't oh. get them canceled again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, well, I think that's, that's actually really important. Um, you know, satire is, you know, my, my dad grew up in, in Europe, um, in part because his father was an academic and couldn't get jobs here in the U United States because he was black. So moved this entire family to post-World War II Germany because they had more opportunities for black people than they had here in the United States. So just a little tidbit there. But you know, in Europe, at the time at least, my dad always would say that satire was, was like the highest art like in, in terms of you know, showing intelligence and things like that. And I think it's, it's really important in politics, um, at least in, in, if we're gonna do news opinion entertainment, I don't see The Daily Show as any different than any Fox News show or any uh, CNN or anything like that. It's just more, sometimes more interesting and, and something you can laugh at. Or, and you know, the Gutfield does it now, I think. He has his own little thing. I think that that's, that's actually a, a high art form and I think it really does have a place um, I think sometimes we need to stop taking ourselves too seriously. I think that's, that's kind of part of this, the anger that we have and we want to choke out our neighbors and, and treat them like, you know, Rand Paul. Like, we should, you know, be able to, to laugh at ourselves every now and again. And sometimes it shows the absurdity of some of our debates, which is my favorite part. Doesn't matter if it's right or left. Satire that shows the absurdity of the full debate I think is sometimes the best kind of satire. 
Yeah, I think there's a really interesting phenomenon in comedy where people are not doing comedy, right? I mean, I don't know if you saw the Hannah Gadsby thing on Netflix where like, I'm not telling jokes because jokes are oppressive, right? <laughs> and I actually, I, I mean, I'm not a comedian, but I actually disagree with that. I think jokes are often the way we share our pain, right? They're the ways in which we explore boundaries, but they're also the ways in which we kind of laugh. It's interesting if you watch people laughing in groups, they're not laughing at jokes. It's a form of social bonding. Laughing at something someone says just sort of signals you like them and that you're, you're, you're with them, you're enjoying a moment with them. And our inability to do that, our, our, our fear of laughter is I think really hurting us in a lot of ways and I think it's sort of sad that, the, you know, like Colbert's still there but it's not, it's super earnest and it's not funny in part because like it's only about laughing at people you dislike. And really good jokes are about laughing at you so I hope we can get back there, but. Real quickly, I, I, I heard what you said about uh, having wide variety of views at universities, but doesn't the university have a responsibility to reject uh, people who come and just lie, just don't use facts? Uh, doesn't the university have the right to, to make a determination, we're not gonna allow this person on because the information they're providing is simply factually incorrect? Uh, and therefore does not uh, further a civic discourse. So by reputation, a given speaker or a good Think guest. An yeah. election, for example, an election denier, a Holocaust denier, someone who, who has written widely about those kinds of things that are clearly untrue. Does that person deserve a place at an I, academic I table? I just so disagree with this. I understand where it comes from, and it comes from a well-meaning place. But, I mean, two things. So first of all, to like, very quick background to me, like I was an early adopter on COVID panic when everyone else was like, everything's fine, it's the flu. I was like, nope, batten down the hatches, COVID hornet is my new hobby. Um, and all throughout until the vaccines, I was a hardcore like cancel everything person. That said, there were a lot of people who wanted to shut those people down, who wanted to shut people down, who asked questions about vaccines, who wanted to, and I disagree with that so fundamentally. And again, on two levels. First of all, I don't, I'm not that sure I'm right about anything. I am not sure enough that I am right about anything to say that person can't speak. And second of all, honestly, like if someone is really that wrong, that obviously incorrect, then I should be able to rebut them pretty convincingly, pretty quickly. We don't, in fact, want to shut down speech that we think is so obviously untrue that no one should hear it. We want to shut down speech that we are afraid we can't rebut. And look, I get it. The election was not stolen. Donald Trump is a, is a vile liar about that. And he has duped his followers into basically stoking his ego at the expense of the country. So I'm not neutral on this. That said, I don't want to shut them out of discourse because they're not going away. They're just going to all be talking around themselves. I want them here so that we can talk so that we can debate so that we can again, try to find some shared ground where we can all agree about what facts are. Responses. Yeah. Um, so I, I I totally agree um, that we cannot shut out 75 million people. You know. So anyone who's like I don't want to talk to any Trump supporters, I'm like you do talk to Trump supporters probably every day, several times a day. So and the fact is, um, you know, with with the election denial, and you know we can take it a step farther. Like I mentioned, Alex Jones. The, the trouble, and I think that you know, the gentleman was, was bringing up, is that lots of people do believe that, what he said about Sandy Hook, you know, which was really painful for a lot of people. And they really do have big platforms. So it's, you know, whether, I think everybody has free speech, but everybody is not owed every platform. You know? So um, I think that there can be discussions you know, uh, about, what the limits are um, in terms of lending this stage to somebody who's a Holocaust denier or, a, you, know, uh, you know, someone who is a, a generally hateful person or violent person or something like that. I think we can have that discussion. Um, I think it's more important, you know, generally, if it's just someone you disagree with, then your First Amendment right, their First Amendment right is to speak your First Amendment right is to protest. You know, so I, I know the right is all, you know, always like, oh my God, look at these liberals yelling at the, you know, outside of this speech. And I'm like, that's their First Amendment right. 
they are allowed to assemble peacefully. And, you know, if they shout and you hear it through and it disrupts or they bang on the walls, they're allowed to do that. I don't know about banging on the walls, but probably. Um, so I, I think that that's okay. Um, and, and in terms of like, you know, our, our you know, with the, the COVID thing, I thought was, was an interesting example. I think that there are lies that were told that put public health in danger. You know, um, the, the woman, the magnetic woman who said, you know, your keys are gonna stick to your body, you know, and she was actually a DO, like she, she's someone who's, you know, a doctor of osteopathic medicine, like, like, yes, she should be reported to her board. They should take her, you know, her, her board certification away. There should be consequences for that that's gonna cause people in a state like Arizona where there's a, a significant elderly population, it's gonna put them in danger. You talked about killing our grandparents. You know, that was something that was really dangerous. But if you wanna have a discussion about vaccine mandates, I think that that's a perfectly valid discussion to have. I had that discussion all the time. I think that that, that was something that should have been, you can't shut that down. That's an important policy discussion. And I think that we should uh, have people who say, look, I don't want to be mandated to take a vaccine because I have bodily autonomy. Bodily autonomy is on the ballot right now, you know, and uh, different, let me be clear, very different. But, you know, I, I still think that that was an argument worth having. So I think that, you know, the discussion is where is the limit? Because there is a limit and what platforms are you actually entitled to? You're not entitled to ASU's platform, you know, now, big tech, that's a different discussion, but you're certainly not entitled to ASU. And lastly, I just wanna say really quick, um, you know, I just think it's so funny, like with all the discussion about the working class that a billionaire socialite from Manhattan, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, has become the voice of the working class or people like J.D. Vance, who's, you know, supported by an investment banker, was an investment banker himself, is somehow, representative of the working class. I would love to see some real working class right and real working class left people have a discussion. But now it's people like, I grew up working class when I was four, you know, and, and then I went to Oxford. You know what I mean? And, in fairness, J.D. Vance did serve in the Marines and like only went to college at like, he, 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 no, he, he served. Like, and, and, he, he, yeah. he is not now working class, but like he's, I, he I hasn't would argue been working that- class in a very long time. You know, and he got $15 million from Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel, who is, by the way, funding somebody in your state. I won't say names, but, you know, who's pulling the strings there? You know, follow the money. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. I think we have time for two quick questions and, two, and brief uh, answers. So I have the pleasure of being a journalism major myself. Um, I also have the pleasure of being incredibly concerned about my future. Uh, come December, I graduate. I've worked for several different newsrooms now, and I've encountered the trappings of wokeism in almost every single one. I'm wondering, have you identified any bright spots in the industry for a young journalist, uh, or, or do you think I should even work independently outside of the traditional news industry in order to, uh, I would say, pursue the aspirational objectivity that I think is the duty of journalists across this country? Well, there's a simple question for a Brief, <laughs> brief answers, quick answers, quickly. Yeah. Uh, try business journalism, which is both disciplined by the market to sort of care about more, object more objectively verifiable stuff than opinion, but also is where there's a ton of jobs, unlike having opinions about politics, where there are very, many fewer jobs and it's a lot more competitive. Everyone thinks it's really boring, but like markets touch everything. And if you have not looked into doing business journalism, high recommend on both a marketability, but both, it's really fun. It's actually you're going to learn a lot. So, if you're passionate about journalism, go forward with journalism. Do something that you're passionate about, that you love coming to work every day. That's you know just some old man advice to you. So don't give up because oh the woke whatever. Definitely pursue your passion, and then you know as I'm sure some people will tell you, you'll never work a day in your life. <laughs> I've certainly followed that maxim. <laughs> okay, thank you. Last question. Yeah, you came here tonight um, from one of the, the pinnacle or near the pinnacle of the media in our country. 
and you eloquently presented a problem statement about what went wrong and what is wrong um, with our media in the newsroom. And in that statement, you, you said that essentially there's a, an echo chamber in the newsroom of hyper-educated elites catering to hyper-educated elites and offending half the country. Um, but at the end, you concluded by saying you don't know what to do about the problem. And my question is, why aren't you trying things like putting a, a conservative in the newsroom and saying, running what you're talking about by the conservative, or going out to those smaller towns and the barber shops that we talked about a little bit earlier and sitting in there and figuring out what the, what the thing is, and then being very honest and upfront with your readers and saying, like, we have done you a disservice. So let me say a few things. Number one, I am the conservative in the newsroom, right? Um, the number two, although I am not representative, right? I, I didn't, I didn't support Donald Trump. Um, I was against him from the very start, and that is not where the right is right now. Uh, you're right. Um, no, but like, the thing is, it's hard to. I mean, we are doing a lot of this stuff. People underweight that. We don't always do it perfectly, but like, and here's the thing: is I will say the mainstream media does try really hard, a lot harder than they're given credit for. It's just a hard task. And the third thing I will say is there is a pipeline problem. And this is not just you know me saying, well, conservatives don't want to be journalists. They don't want to be journalists. And I'm telling you, I speak to, I have so many friends at all of the leading conservative publications, at the libertarian publications. My husband works for one of the libertarian. The pipeline, you know, at a liberal publication, you are fighting off applications from hundreds of incredibly well-qualified journalists who have amazing clips. And in a conservative or libertarian publication, you are scrounging for the, like, the 10 kids who are from these papers. Now, is that all the fault because conservatives are bad people who don't care about the truth or don't know how to write? No. I think it's a very complicated thing going on where like people see that the media is liberal and then they're like, well, that's not for me, right? There's a, there's a two-way street here, but it is two-way. And it's hard to get the people to do it simply because they don't exist. We reach out and we look for those people and they aren't there. So I think um, you know, there's, there's a lot of complicated things going on there, but a big problem is that conservatives need to show up, and I, I, like, I tell them this. They need to prepare to do it. If you want a, a better, more balanced media, you need to go out there, and first of all, you need to stop just reporting on conservative stuff. You need to stop just writing about how much you hate the mainstream media and how much you disagree with this on everything. You need to like get good reporting chops. You need to learn how to write about something that is not your angry anger about politics. Because you're, if you are super angry and rage-filled and you hate everyone in the mainstream media, you're not gonna be a good fit in a newsroom. And so, like, right, like in, any more than a super angry, woke leftist is gonna be a great fit at at National Review, right? Even if National Review wants to hire them, it's just going to be hard at the lunch table. And so, like, conservatives need to do their part, and they haven't. We need to do more than we are. I absolutely agree about that. I push through this all the time. And I want to say, for all of my complaints about the media and so forth, I just want to say, like, my newsroom has been so supportive of me. My colleagues, like ask me to sit on in meetings to make sure that there's someone who's raising the issues that they might not see. We are trying to do the work. Do we do it perfectly? No, we have a lot farther to go. Um, but I do think that like, and, and of course we are fighting some people in the media who really don't think those conservatives should be there. And I am out there every day being like, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you will destroy us. Um, but it, like conservatives also need to, to be providing us more to work with and right now they're not. And I, like, I don't think that's all their fault, but like someone's got to go there and get the kids and convince them to do this path, because otherwise we can't hire them. Please join me one last time in thanking Bacha and Gar Sargon, <laughs> Megan McArdle, and Jason Nichols.